Hi, I'm Jack Revell, and this is Continuous Improvement. Continuous Improvement Television, CITV. Today is Monday, March 13th, and we're in Madison, Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. My guest today, the well-known, virtually infamous, Peter Schultes. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the series if you've not had the opportunity to watch us before. We've, we've been on the air now once a month, the second Monday of the month, since June of last year, June 1994. Uh, today is the second in the series in the spring 1995 uh, presentations. Last month we had Steve Ungari, the president of the American Supplier Institute International, talking to us about TRIZ, this Russian problem-solving technique. If you did not have the opportunity to see the, uh, the show live, I would urge you to contact NTU and obtain the, uh, the video all about the theory of innovative problem solving. I'll tell you a little bit more about what Peter is going to be talking about in just a moment. Uh, next month, our guest will be Bill Conway, former chairman and CEO of Nashua Corporation, the first corporation in the United States to recognize the wisdom and the, the, the brilliance of the late W. Edwards Deming. Uh, he's, uh, Bill Conway is now the chairman of his own firm, Conway Quality, and he will be talking to us about what every uh, CEO should know about quality. Uh, the month after that, we'll be coming to you from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where our guest will be Shin Taguchi, talking about robust design and the quality loss function. The following month, June 1995, we'll be back here at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, talking to the preeminent uh, experimenter uh, in the world today, Dr. George Box. Uh, Dr. Box will be talking to us about his approach to classical design of experiments. Enough about the past and the future, let's talk about today. Our guest today, Mr. Peter Schultes. Peter is the, the leader of his own firm uh, entitled Schultes Seminars and Consulting located here in Madison, Wisconsin. And by way of background, Peter is from Chicago, uh, a graduate of uh, high school in Oak Park. He's done undergraduate and graduate work. Uh, his degree in adult education, his master's degree uh, from, the excuse me, from Boston University in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, for, for many years, uh, Peter worked with the uh, city government here in the city of Madison. Over the last 10 years, he worked with Joyner Associates, and now, as of last year, uh, on his own, uh, leading Schultes seminars and consulting is Peter Schultes. Well known for a variety of, of uh, achievements, uh, especially in the areas of team building, understanding the, the functions of teams, and in the area of performance appraisal. Uh, we are truly fortunate today to have with us as our guest, Peter Schultes. Peter, Welcome. Before I, I bring you on, I, I do need to mention to the audience some housekeeping items. Uh, for example, Peter will be making a presentation to us uh, this morning during this first hour before the break. And when we come back, we'll have a dialogue, a question and answer dialogue, that will enable you who are watching, uh, the participants who are watching the, the show today, uh, to call in and fax in your questions. During this first hour, uh, since uh, we will be uh, delaying our questions till the second hour, you are encouraged to call in or to fax in your, your questions, your comments for either Peter or myself relative uh, to this or uh, any related topic that, uh, that Peter specializes in. Uh, during the break and during the second hour, feel free to call in or to fax in your questions and we will do the best we can to respond to them. Uh, the fax number uh, that you should be uh, using in order to contact us uh, should be up on your screen right now. And funny enough, I cannot see the beginning of it because of the location of the clock, but the last four digits are 6067. Peter, what's the number? Area code 608. I can't read the second three numbers either. 760-6067. You can tell that, you know, we're only human beings, folks. We're, we're not perfect, and so uh, uh, bear with us on that, on that item. But having uh, displayed our, our humanity, I will now turn you over to a real humanist, Peter Schultes. Peter, welcome to uh, Continuous Improvement TV, and uh, we really look forward to hearing uh, what you've got to say today. Thanks, Jack. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. We're going to be talking today about teams. 
uh, why we work together or why we work poorly together, if that be the case. I'm going to talk a, about teams under four categories of information. First, I'm going to talk about what I consider to be the basics, the basics of an organization, the basics of, <clears throat> of uh, good work, uh, what, what constitutes successful work, and a little bit about the uh, systems view of an organization versus a hierarchical view of an organization, which I think is an extremely important distinction. Then I'm going to talk about systems and teamwork. How do teams function in a way that's consistent with systems thinking? First of all, we want to talk about what is a system. Then we'll talk about this interdependence between a team and the system in which it works. In the third part of the notes, I'll be talking about the types of teams. And we will uh, be talking about five different types of teams. Uh, the materials are in your notes. And I hope all of you do have copies of the notes with you. Uh, because particularly in that section, it'll be useful for you to have some notes to look at as we talk about the different types of teams. Finally, I'll be talking about the ingredients of a successful team. Um, when to use a team, when not to use a team, different ingredients that we know from various uh, research sources uh, are ingredients characteristic of successful teams. And then finally, I'll provide you with a checklist to use uh, uh, with your teams to see if they're inclined more toward the characteristics of successful teams or perhaps in a less than successful direction. So let's start out with section one, the, the basics of an organization. On page three of your, of your notes, you'll see a diagram uh, entitled The Basics of an Organization. And it's, uh, it, it describes every kind of organization, from your Friday night uh, poker game to your bridge club to your church group to your business organization or to some subunit of your business organization. All of those can be said to be an aggregate of people who are pursuing some common purpose and using some kinds of systems or processes or methods as they pursue that purpose. There, there's a, a lot that can be uh, learned from just uh, reflecting on this notion of an organization. And it helps me often when I start feeling like I'm being confused or like there's too many things being taught about organizations that don't make sense. It, it helps me to return to some kind of basic principle or basic concept such as this. For one thing, if you look at these three components, you can ask questions like, when we don't achieve our purpose, when the purpose is not being successfully pursued, how do you explain that? The traditional answer in, in American business has been, or in American organizations, has been when we aren't achieving our purpose, we find out what's wrong with the people. Or we do some, something in order to improve the people. So uh, we motivate our people because obviously we're not achieving our goal because they're not sufficiently motivated. Or when things go wrong, we try to find who screwed up, who made the mistake. Or we, we try to give incentives or have contests or carrots and sticks to try to get our people to do things. We, we have a lot of premises behind our management theories which, which reflect fairly cynical beliefs about people and fairly cynical solutions. We believe that, for instance, that, um, th that the source of our quality problems is the inadequacy of our people. Uh, the dereliction of duty of our people. We also believe that um, people are withholding a certain amount of effort waiting for it to be bribed out of them. That's another pretty cynical belief. And we, we put together a whole bunch of management practices based on that. Uh, now, what does this concept have to do with teamwork? Well, well, one of the things that we do often when we're not successfully achieving our purpose is to say, ah, what we have to do is to put, put our people into teams. So we organize people into teams. Uh, because we think that's the right thing to do, and it's based on a belief that the reason why we're not achieving our goals is that our people are not adequately formed into teams. Well, maybe that's not the problem. And in fact, at the heart of the quality movement, the movement begun by Dr. W. Edwards Deming in Japan in 1950, at the heart of the quality movement is a belief that a negligible portion of your problems are the result of the inadequacy of your people. By far, 95% or more of your problems are there in the systems and processes and methods. And so it's a shift in focus from people and what you do to people to improve uh, your, your, your chances of achieving your purpose. It's a shift from the people to the systems and processes and methods. 
to understand what a system is, to understand what a process is, and, and understand how to study them and improve them. That's at the heart of the quality movement. And we have to let go of our obsession with the people. We, have to, we, we will not improve our ability to achieve our purpose by empowering people or by holding people accountable. I know that those are, are fashionable words, but, but in fact, they're still what they have in common that I think is the wrong approach, is that they still are focused on the people and not on the systems and processes. Uh, I'm sure that that will trigger, trigger quite a bit of, of, of conversation and perhaps some questions. It, uh, but, it certainly will for me. Okay, <laughs> well, well, I look forward to that. But let's move on a little bit. Um, because I believe that, that the, the, the focusing on the people is conventional management practice and not, and not part of the new science of management that we've been developing since the 1950s. On page four is a diagram that comes from the Cherokee tribe. There's a woman named Diana Uahu who has written about Cherokee uh, lore and Cherokee wisdom. Uh, she is uh, part of the uh, Yawahu family, uh, which have had for the last 27 generations the responsibility of maintaining the wisdom of the Cherokee nation. And, um, and, and before the Yawahus, another family had that responsibility, but it's a, it's a privileged position in the Cherokee tribe. It's a very uh, important responsibility to, to keep track of, the, of the, what was originally the oral tradition of Cherokee wisdom. And this, I learned from one of her books, this is the, this, these are the ingredients of successful work as seen by the Cherokee people. And I bring this on here because it, I think, first of all, I think it's pretty right on target. And secondly, it reminds me that, that with all of our fancy new management philosophy, we have maybe captured some of the primal truths of, of ancient people, such as the Cherokees. But at any rate, the, the Cherokees say, if you want to be successful, there's got to be three factors that must be present. One of those factors is a clear intention. Um, you have to have a purpose that's constant. Deming talks about constancy of purpose as one of his first principles for managers. Uh, constancy of purpose, clarity of purpose. You have to know what you're going to do. If your purpose is ambiguous, everything else after that will be ambiguous. If your purpose keeps changing, everything after that will not be on target. So you must have a clear, constant intention that's part of what you're doing. Secondly, you have to have skillful means. That, 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 that implies two things. First of all, you have to have methods that you use in order to achieve that clear intention, but also you have to be skillful at those methods. And then the third uh, component of Cherokee success is what they call affirmation. And by that, they mean a sense of integrity about what you do. That what you do is consistent with the tribal values and consistent with your own personal values. That, that when you're pursuing this purpose and using these means, uh, that you're not compromising uh, what's right to do. What you might be proposing to do something that's very different from the traditional tribal practice, but at its heart, it's not inconsistent with the values of the tribe. That's what affirmation means. And I think those three components are, are important for us today as well. And, and we can use that as a way of measuring how how good our work is, and maybe uh, a, almost a checklist to use against unsuccessful work. Are any of those three components missing? On page five are two diagrams, one showing the old way of thinking about an organization, and another one showing Deming systems view. And I want to talk first about the old way of looking at an organization. I could sometimes give a, an entire week seminar just on, this, on these two diagrams. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about the history of this, of this old chart. Um, it, we tend to think that it was uh, carved in stone and brought down from Mount Ararat, but it wasn't. Uh, this chart was first used in American business as a result of a train wreck in western Massachusetts. Um, there was a track on the, the Western Railroad, which in those days, in 1840, uh, western rail systems consisted of western Massachusetts. Um, and, the, and the Western Railroad had an accident on one of its lines, uh, line, a, a track that ran between, I believe, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, and, uh, and Albany, New York. <clears throat> and uh, and they had, uh, at one time, they had just one train running on this line, and then eventually business got better, and they had six trains running on it. And the inevitable happened. Two of them ran into each other. 
and a couple people were killed and several people were injured and it was the equivalent of the space shuttle disaster of its day. And a commission was appointed to study the accident and make recommendations. The commission headed by Major Whistler. And Major Whistler's commission came up with several uh, uh, observations with regard to the accident itself, but also recommended a way by which or, uh, railroads should be run. And this traditional organizational chart was first applied to business as a result of that train wreck accident and the Whistler Commission report. What this diagram tells us, and if you look closely at it, uh, you'll, you'll see that at the top of the organization, of course, is the leader of the organization. The next layer of divisions would reflect maybe the various trunk lines of the railroad, but then it keeps dividing things down into the re individuals and their individual responsibilities. One of the things that's unique to this chart, by the way, is the appearance of a new position in American organizations called manager. Prior to this time, there were no managers. There was no such position. So now we've got managers. And the, and the responsibilities of the managers were described in detail, and the, and the responsibilities of every individual down to the lowest paid uh, position in the organization were described in sufficient detail so that, and this is almost a direct quote from the Whistler Commission's report, so that when something went wrong, we would know who was derelict in his duty. The premise behind the traditional organizational chart is that thing, the, the systems are okay if we even indeed recognize that there are such things as systems. Things are okay if everyone would do his or her job. The cause of problems is dereliction of duty. So the purpose of the organization is to control people's behavior so they do what they're supposed to do. Because we know if things go wrong, it's because somebody screwed up. Now that was the intent of this chart from the beginning. It reflected uh, uh, in 1840 the new management philosophy. It's been the prevailing management philosophy in this country since 1840, continues to be the prevailing management philosophy today. The reason why this is important when we're talking about teams is that we knew back in the 1930s, for instance, the importance of having teams. But at that time, that was before Deming's uh, quality uh, revolution in 1950, back in the 30s and 40s, the efficacy of teams was a matter of how to use teams to improve the performance of the traditional hierarchically based organization. If you ask the question in the hierarchical organization, whom should we please, the answer is our boss, or our boss's boss, or our boss's boss's boss. Um, so that the purpose of teams was to help the individuals in the organization to do their duties, their jobs. It was also aimed around fulfilling the wishes and needs of the people in the hierarchy who line managers who ran the business. So uh, that's a very different view, point of view and purpose and, and uh, environment in the organization than the second view of the organization. So let's look at the second view, which is the new approach to management, Deming Systems view of the organization. This is a diagram that Deming used uh, in his first lecture in Japan in the summer of 1950 in Tokyo. It was um, unlike what you see on your screens or in your participants' notes. Uh, it was drawn by hand on a chalkboard back in 1950. He put it up there um, because it occurred to him uh, that this was a pretty good way of describing an organization. And this is pretty much the same diagram that he used. He, he said it ended up being the most important graphic in all of his lectures in Japan. That it was, he used it, referred to it the most often. People in his, uh, his students in his classes referred to it most often in asking their questions or making their points. It was an indispensable graphic presentation of what an organization is. And when we look at that, org at that view of the organization, what we see is a flow of activities. Everything moves in a certain direction and ends with the consumers. The first point then is that organizations exist to serve the consumers, the people who are going to use the products, the people who are going to benefit from the services. And everything prior to the point where it gets delivered to the consumers needs to be aligned so that the consumers uh, consistently get what's important to them. You'll also notice the, the arrows across the top of the diagram going back toward the system. 
Um, it, it's feed, feedback loops, research to tell the company what the consume, what's important to the consumers in the first place, and in the second, so that we can design the right products or design the right services, and also what's Im important after we have our products out there and being used by consumers, we get feedback so we can learn what's necessary in order to improve the products and services and improve the processes. So if we were to take any arrow in that diagram and, and, and uh, expand it and blow it up, we would see that it's a, it's a microcosm of the whole system. Everything in our organizations functions in this flow of interdependent activities. It starts with the ideas for the products, the, the research, the information from consumers in the first place, then the design of the products, and then the manufacturing and delivery of the products that go to the customers. But everything focuses on the customers. It's an entirely different view of the organization. In this view of the organization, when something goes wrong, uh, when, you, when you ask wh why are we having problems, the answer is always something to the effect that we're having, we're experiencing inadequacies in our systems. In this way of viewing, you don't look for a culprit. In the old way of viewing the organization, you look for culprits. In this way of viewing the organization, you look for inadequacies in the system. In the old way of viewing the organization, when you ask whom should we please, the answer is your boss. In this way of viewing the organization, when you ask whom should we please, the answer is our customers, our external customer and internal customers at every step of the way on the way to the outside customer. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very different way of identifying the priorities. It's a very different way of identifying what's important. It's a very different way of defining what quality is. In Deming Systems view, the, the customers define what a good job is. In, in the hierarchical view, the boss defines what a good job is. And it takes very different reflexes, very different instincts, very different relationships uh, to operate in the new paradigm, the new way of management that was started in 1950, the systems view of the organization. Now once again, teams are important. Teams, are, teams make a hierarchical organization work better than they would have without teams. But what teams do in a systems organization makes teams different, and the way teams are formed, and the purpose of teams, and the dynamics of teams. And so we're going to spend some time talking about that. But I wanted you to, to have a sense of this absolutely revolutionary, new, profoundly different view of an organization uh, that's a result of what D Dr. Deming taught the Japanese in 1950. Um, and, and my experience in teaching this, uh, this philosophy over the last uh, 12 years is that um, it, it's, it's very different from what managers even imagine it to be. Most of the time, people teaching quality tend to trivialize it. That's at its worst, they'll, they'll trivialize it. <clears throat> Often, even well-intentioned people tend to underemphasize the importance of a systems view. Without understanding a systems view of an organization, you can't understand what's at the heart of the quality movement, and therefore everything else you do, um, uh, management interventions, ways of, of relating to people, um, uh, will will reflect more likely the old philosophy of management rather than the new one. Um, the whole notion of empowering people reflects the hierarchical view of the organization. People in the higher levels of the hierarchy empower people in the lower levels of the hierarchy. And I suppose if you're going to stay with a hierarchical set of premises, uh, empowerment's better than no empowerment. But if we're going to try to convert our thinking to a systems view, then it, the, the notion of empowerment has no meaning in a systems organization. So at best, I would see empowerment as a, as a sort of fad that might help in the transition from the old way of viewing the organization to the new way, but not much more than that. Let's move on to section two of the notes. We'll be expanding on this notion of the relationship now between systems and teamwork and getting a little more sense of, of uh, what we mean by that notion. And let's, let's start out with what uh, what a system is. What do we mean by a system? And, and to understand a system, we must start with purpose. So you'll notice on page 2-3, over in the right-hand corner, there's a box that talks about the purpose. You have to know what your purpose is. Now, I've got some notions there of, of purpose, uh, uh, especially purposes that are appropriate for business organizations. 
But even then, even in service organizations, nonprofit organizations, government organizations, there still is a need to find customers, to identify who the customers are, and to achieve those characteristics, quality characteristics that are important to the customers, to successfully transmit to customers whatever capabilities are important to them. Let me, let me tell a little story, I think, that <clears throat> makes this point. Conic Camera was unhappy with the feedback they were getting from their customers. They were unhappy because the feedback was all positive. Now imagine your company being dissatisfied because you weren't getting any customer complaints. Imagine that for a minute. <clears throat> they were talking about this and somebody was, had this very simple but very brilliant insight. And it was this. You know, we keep talking about customers buying our cameras and getting feedback from our customers about our cameras. But in fact, customers don't buy the cameras because they want a camera. They buy cameras because they want to take a photograph. So instead of asking people for feedback on our cameras, why don't we ask our customers for feedback on the photographs that they take with our cameras? Because that's the point of application. And in fact, we ought to define ourselves not as, se as selling cameras, but as selling the capability to take photographs. That's a very profound insight. If the buggy whip manufacturers saw themselves not as being in the business of selling buggy, buggy whips, but as selling the capabilities for vehicular acceleration, they might have withstood the transition from the horse and buggy days to the horseless carriage days. Um, the, so, so they were able, because of that simple redefinition of what they do, to get feedback from their customers on the photographs. And customers said, I love your camera, but I can't take a good photograph with it. Some are out of focus, some are too light, some are too dark, uh, some are superimposed on each other. And that led Konica to the, uh, develop the technology of the automatic focusing, automatic film focusing, all those things that we now take for granted in our 35 millimeter cameras. So, so imagine if you and your organization were to, to define, redefine yourselves, not in terms of the product you sell or the service that you provide to your customers, but in terms of the capability that they acquire as a result of their interaction from you. You might redefine the purpose of the organization, and the redefinition of the purpose of the organization will then help you to do a better job of defining what system needs to be in place in order to deliver on that purpose. Dr. Deming always made a big point about if you don't know the purpose of anything, then you don't know what the system is. You can't have a system without purpose. And um, a similar example would be if you were, as you watch this video, if you're sitting at a table of some sort or a desk and, and somebody were to come along and ask you to clean off that table, um, that's not a sufficient definition of the purpose for you to know what's the appropriate method or system for cleaning off the table. If they said, oh, we want you to clean off the table so we can dance on it, that's one purpose, and you would try to define what's the appropriate method for cleaning off the table. If they said, we want to eat off the table, that would be another method or purpose or system of, of cleaning off the table. If they said, we're going to perform surgery on this table, then that redefines the purpose sufficiently that, that you cannot use a method that might have been appropriate for cleaning a table to eat off of. Um, you have to have some other definition of cleanliness and another um, another set, set of methods and processes and steps in order to accomplish that purpose. So, so there's this, there's this uh, inescapable connection between purpose and systems. You have to know the purpose before you know the system. So that's why in this, in this model that you see on page 2-3, I'm starting out with the far right hand uh, end of that. You have to have the purpose. And once you have the purpose, the rest will fall into place. It at least allows you to put the rest into place. The rest of the diagram, of course, is the CPOC model, uh, the, uh, an acronym that stands for suppliers, <coughs> excuse me, suppliers, input, processes, output, customers. This is a pretty simple way of imagining what a system is. Uh, and ordinarily, you start, as I said, with a purpose, knowing what the purpose is that allows you to define who your customers are. Knowing the purpose of the customers al allows you to define what's the appropriate output. Once you know those things, the output going to the customers to serve a certain purpose, then you can identify the process, the systems, the methods that are appropriate to accomplish that. And, and part of the system, of course, is the input that you need from the suppliers on the out, outside. When you look at an organization this way, for instance, if we were to look at healthcare this way, um, uh, we, we'd find some interesting things. For instance, insurance companies are not the customers. 
because the purpose of the organization is to not make insurance companies wealthy. The purpose of the organization is to serve the health care needs of people who have health care needs. And the only time insurance people are the customers of the health care system is when they have health care needs. They are the patients in the hospitals or the people participating in some of the preventive health care um, programs of various uh, clinics. Uh, insurance companies are suppliers. They supply the health care system with funds. Doctors are suppliers. They supply the health care uh, system with capabilities. So it's, it's important to, to, to see a systems viewpoint to even find out what's the sequence of interdependencies. Which, which do you have to focus on first and second and third and fourth? And, and ultimately, it all pivots around the, the customers and what's important to the customers. So that's what we mean by a system. Uh, often we use the word systems in, in, in ways that aren't quite altogether clear. <clears throat> and, and, and so let me elaborate a little bit more on what, what I mean by systems. On page four, I, I talk about systems and processes and methods. And, and there's also, a, a, I use as an example, the worldwide Pizza Hut chain. And, and <clears throat> the word systems, processes, and methods, to some extent, reflect the CPOC model as it's applied to various gradations, various, various scales of thinking. So if you're talking about the worldwide Pizza Hut chain, that's a huge macro system. If you can break that system down to in some smaller component part of the system, like, the, uh, like a regional Pizza Hut uh, system or a, a single Pizza Hut restaurant, it's still a system, but it's on a smaller scale of viewpoint. <clears throat> Within the Pizza Hut restaurant itself are fairly complex processes. Running the kitchen is maybe a small system or a large process. At some point, you don't know when you've passed the threshold from one to another. The idea is that a system consists of a number of processes, uh, but there's no clear borderline when you've, you've passed the world of systems into the world of processes. <clears throat> Making a pizza is itself a process, a process that's by itself fairly complex because you've got a number of components. You've got a, a smaller process making the pizza sauce, another process making the pizza dough, another process the actual cooking uh, process. Interestingly enough, by the way, you can, you can take any recipe <clears throat> in any cookbook and convert it into a flow chart using the CPOC model. Uh, I've seen that done, in fact, in presentation at quality conferences. A woman who, who taught her children how to cook by converting simple recipes into flow charts, into a CPOC model. That's another workshop and another story, however. Uh, the, the making of pizza dough can be seen as a, a simple, um, smaller process um, with its steps. It's got its suppliers, its inputs, its process, its outputs, its customers, its purpose. Um, all of those need to be in, in consistency, need to be consistent with each other. Uh, there's a method within the making of pizza dough. There's a method rolling out the dough. Do you roll it out with a rolling pin? Do you spin it in the air? There's various methods for doing it. Each of them has suppliers, inputs, process, outputs, customers. Um, and then even within that, there's a single step. There's, uh, whoever's going to roll out the dough probably has to sprinkle the surface of the table with uh, either cornmeal or flour or something. That's a step within the process. So, so, so the notion of this is that, is that everything is part of a larger system. And we need to understand almost everything we do in terms of what precedes it and what follows it. And the more we can understand how what we do fits into a system, the more that we can uh, study the system and improve the system. And when things go wrong, we can find out where in the system uh, something had been inadequately uh, planned or inadequately executed. And that's, that's the notion of systems thinking, is to not think in small, isolated uh, events, but in, to think in larger flows and larger relationships of interdependence. And when we're working on a team, the team has to appreciate uh, in, a, in the task it's working on how this task fits in into the system. It, the team also has to appreciate how it, as an organizational unit called a team, fits into larger units, larger systems within the organization. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a minute. But I want to uh, just use another graphic on page five. Uh, to describe the interdependence of three things now. We've already talked about the interdependence between purpose and systems. As Dr. Deming says, if you don't have a purpose, you don't have a system. Well, I suggest that the same thing is true, the same kind of interdependence exists between purpose and teams. 
If you don't have a purpose, you don't have a team. One of the things that I notice being a problem with teams is that they are groups of people who are thrown together. They sit in the same room at the same time, but because they have no clear purpose, they don't know what to do. They spend a lot of their time talking about what it is they're supposed to do, and they are not yet a team. It's when a group of people have a clear purpose, then, then they can be called the beginning of a team. Then they'll be able to make themselves into a team when previously they were just an aggregate of individuals kind of wallowing around looking for something to do. But there's a similar interdependence between systems and teamwork. Without systems, teams cannot uh, pursue their purpose. So teams need systems. That is, they need the methods for doing good work. And it's my belief that if you want to create teamwork in a group of people, the best way to do that is to, is to give them a, a job worth doing and the methods to do it successfully. There's nothing like success to assure teamwork. There's nothing like failure to, to dissipate teamwork, to, to, div, to be divisive in a group of people. Uh, so, so when teams are having trouble forming themselves, when groups of people are having trouble forming themselves into teams, then I look to see if they've got a purpose worth pursuing and the right methods in order to pursue that purpose. Similarly, systems need teams. Teams are the glue that hold systems together. Teams, teams breathe the heart and soul into, into systems. So that, so that we, we cannot think of any of these three components. They're all important. We cannot think of any of them as isolated from the other two. And by the way, you probably already noticed there's a very similar, there's a great similarity between that diagram on page 2-5 and the Cherokee wisdom. Now, for all of our fancy language, we've perhaps not come a great long way from what the Cherokees found out generations and generations ago. Now, let me talk a little bit about the, the, the kind of uh, interdependence of, of systems and teams, uh, exploring this a little bit more. You'll notice on page 2-6 uh, a diagram that shows just the group of people um, and its purpose and its teamwork and its system. So I want to talk now about an isolated team. That, that group of people, maybe a half dozen people or so, um, it's important for them, as I've said already, that they have a common purpose, that they have systems and processes and methods for accomplishing their task, and that they have certain components that help them uh, form themselves as a team. Um, some of them are you know, meeting methods, sort of ways of managing the traffic in an ordinary group discussion, ways of resolving conflict and differences of opinion, ways of getting to know each other better as a group of people. There are various things. Uh, the team handbook, which I wrote, uh, focuses to a great deal on what groups of people should do to help them uh, both build themselves as a team and also uh, pursue the task that's been assigned to them. Now that team, that small group of people, doesn't exist in isolation. It's part of a larger organization. So on page seven, you'll notice that that team that we just looked at existing within a larger entity called the organization, the whole organizational structure. The organization itself has a purpose. The organization itself has its systems. And the organization has what I would call an environment of teamwork. What are those things that help people in this organization feel like they're part of a, of a common entity? They're all in this boat rowing in the same direction as opposed to trying to work at odds with each other. What I notice in organizations are these kind of functional ramparts. The organization isn't a team because each functional unit within the organization acts as though it's an organization unto itself and in fact sometimes views other parts of the organization as its adversaries. Um, now, the, the, how well, what kind of an environment of teamwork exists in the whole organization will, to a great extent, determine whether or not the um, uh, small groups of people within the organization can function well as a team. Uh, th there's, there's this interdependence between the teamwork of an organization and the teamwork uh, of the small groups within it. How well a small group can pursue its purpose depends to a great extent on whether its purpose is, uh, can be integrated with and consistent with the purpose of the larger organization. If the purpose of the small group contradicts the purpose of the organization, it's going to have a tough time. Um, 
and, and then similarly, the systems and processes and methods of the small group need to be uh, consistent with and consonant with the processes and systems and methods of the larger organization. <coughs> now let me go one step further again, and on page eight you see that that organization with its small group within it exists in a larger world, the community or the nation. We could keep going until we end up with the planet or the universe, but the point is, here is that uh, to a great extent, how well an organization can ex uh, pursue its purpose depends on whether its purpose is, is consonant with the purpose of the larger community. How well it can use its methods depends on how well its methods are consonant with the larger community. Um, and and, the, and the, the ability to achieve teamwork in an organization is sometimes reflects the, the kind of teamwork, the kind of community uh, environment in the, in the whole organization. So uh, all, I'm not saying that it's impossible to succeed in spite of the larger environment or the larger community, but, but, but how well and how quickly and how easily you can move depends uh, to a great deal on how, on how much support you get from the larger community. There's also a, um, uh, there, there's, there's an interdependence here uh, in, the sense, in this sense, that what's good perhaps for one small group of people in the organization may not be good for the whole organization and its systems and its customers. Similarly, what's good for this organization and its systems and, and its customers may not be good for the whole community. Um, so I hope that when we get more, more deeply into systems thinking, and again, this is a series of seminars all by itself, we appreciate that we can no longer afford to think so independently that we don't take into consideration the larger system. What's good for General Motors is not necessarily good for the country. In fact, what's good for one part of General Motors might not be good for all of General Motors. What's good for the country might not be good for the world. How do sorry, I, excuse me. I want everybody to know that despite the fact that I'm a General Motors employee, Peter is, is speaking on, on his perspective, not on behalf of General Motors, which pays my salary. <laughs> thought I'd remind you of that. <laughs> um, I, uh, I think that was uh, some, some kind of a uh, disclaimer, a disclaimer and, uh, and, and warning on the label of the product. <laughs> but, the, but, but I suspect people who are sophisticated at systems thinking in General Motors would agree that they cannot simply think in terms of what's good for General Motors. If, if what's good for General Motors hurts the country, then they have, they, they have to be very cautious about that. That's, and, 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 and the major point that I'm making is that we cannot think in, merely in terms of local systems. We have to think in terms of the implications for the larger systems. When Dr. Deming went to Japan, he said to the country, you must think of Japan as a system. And I had the privilege once of going, visiting a conference in Moscow, uh, and Dr. Deming asked Dr. Deming if he would want me to bring to that conference held in the Kremlin itself, uh, a message from him, and he wrote a letter in which he said, in effect, to the to the uh, to Russia and to the then deteriorating right before our eyes that particular uh, time of the year, uh, the deteriorating uh, former Soviet Union. And what he said to them is that the former Soviet Union must see itself as a system. If you see yourselves as small groups of adversaries fighting among each other, you will not succeed. And he was right. Um, and it's still right. They have to see themselves as a system. The United States has to see itself as a system. The world has to see itself as a system. That's part of the, the profound impact of systems thinking. But, but I'm going well beyond the scope of thinking of systems as, a, as they relate to small groups. So I will return to small groups and, and types of teams. Um, um, because I just wanted to, to, to us to see those within a larger context. So let's go to section three and the types of teams. <clears throat> and and uh, you'll notice on, on, in section three, on, uh, on, on that page, um, excuse me, on page three dash uh, four and five and, and six, all of the notions, uh, all the various types of teams, there are several types of teams listed. And I think it would, it would uh, not be useful for me to go through them, each of them individually. I want to just point out the notes on pages 3, 4, and 5, 
And notice that I talk about natural work groups, whether they're leaderless groups or leaderful groups, business teams, um, uh, which are usually teams formed around systems, more specifically around systems. <clears throat> also, I talk about management teams, either the executive team at the top of the organization. I also talk about management teams, uh, linchpin teams. That is, if you look at an organization, take the hierarchical organization and have every manager be a member of the team led by the manager above him or her and be uh, themselves managers of teams that include the folks who report to him or her. Uh, so you have this cascading uh, effect of teams from the top of the organization down through the organization. That's what Rensis Lickert would call linchpin teams. Uh, in addition to management teams and uh, linchpin teams, there's also teams formed around the development of new products or new services. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a kind of team that has some uh, needs all by itself. There's also uh, process redesign teams or re-engineering teams, teams that are not designing necessarily the product, but they're redesigning the process by which products are made. And then there's uh, improvement projects. Most of the team handbook focuses on that last category of uh, cross-functional project teams uh, making improvements. Uh, so, that, so they're one of, of uh, a half dozen or seven different kinds of teams. Um, and I talk on those three pages of, for each team. I give some brief description of what kind of team it is, what its purpose is, when to use it, strengths, vulnerabilities, strategies, methods, and tools. If you're familiar with some of the basic tools, the improvement methodology, or other tools, you might recognize some of those. If, you, if, those, if some of the jargon in the strategies, methods, and tools column is unfamiliar with you, uh, to you, then I would recommend that you take some courses um, on some of the improvement methodology. And then the last column for each of those, I make comments. Um, I will leave that material for you to look at on your own. And if you have some questions, be happy to uh, answer those questions in the second half of the show. I want to say a word, however, I'm page 3-7, a word about self-directed or leaderless teams. Um, it's a, one of the things that worries me about self-directed teams is that it's something of a fad. I'm, I get leery every time I hear anything that sounds like a fad. And I have been in organizations working where there, where there had been this proliferation of self-directed work teams. And mostly what was clear to me is that these self-directed work teams had no clear purpose no clear definition of what it meant to be self-directed, no clear definition of what items they were directing themselves on. And so they used to spend inordinate amounts of time talking about why do we exist and what are we supposed to do and what does it mean to be self-directed. Um, that's a travesty. That's not doing anybody any favors to, to create something with such, surrounded by such ambiguity. Again, a team, if it's self-directed, still needs to understand its purpose and its methods and what and its, its purpose and its methods, its systems, its processes, and, and what kind of things it needs to do to form itself into a team. On page seven, you'll see this continuum describing uh, something I think is important with regard to self-directed or, or leaderless teams. First of all, you'll notice at the extreme ends of this diagram that the, the diagonal line does not touch the corners. Down there at the end that would be mark number one, it means that this team is not very self-directed. It's largely advisory, but in fact, no team is purely advisory. Uh, at least informally, they do have the ability to influence decisions um, and, to, and a little bit of autonomy. At the other end of the continuum down there, Number 10 is a team, a team that is almost entirely autonomous, that is self-directed. But no team is entirely autonomous. No team is entirely self-directed. So that's why I'm reluctant to, to let that diagonal line touch the corners of the diagram. The thing that's important for me is to realize that self-direction is really a matter of, of increment. How self-directed is any group? And that has to be made clear from the beginning when a, when a team is a self-directed team is, is uh, put in place. What are the functions on which they will be self-directed? And how will they perform those functions? We can see leadership as a role, a, a, an individual position called leader, and that person uh, has the responsibilities and the functions that we associate with, with the leader. 
if you don't have a leader, the functions and responsibilities don't go away, but they're shared among a group of people. So part of the process is to identify what those things are and to find a way to deploy them in the self-directed team. There's a little flow chart on page 3-8 in which the sequence of steps uh, that I would recommend be followed is, is described. You start by identifying the needed leadership functions. You determine the best known sequence for performing each of these functions. You decide how the functions will be distributed among the team members. You train the team members in the skills and methods needed to perform those leadership functions. And then you implement this self-direction and use the PDCA, or as Dr. Deming would have us call it, the PDSA, plan, do, check, act, cycle. It's an endless uh, cycling of studying, uh, doing something and studying uh, what you can learn from it and adjusting it and then planning to do it over again and so forth. Uh, that's, a, that's a seminar all by itself, how, how to, how to uh, implement PDCA cycles throughout the organization. I want to talk about some of the ingredients of a successful team and I want to start with a quote that comes from 66 AD, a gentleman named Petronius Arbiter who wrote the Satyricon. We trained hard, but it seemed that every time we were beginning to form up into teams, we would be reorganized. I was to learn later in life that we tend to meet any new situation by reorganizing. And a wonderful method it can be for creating the illusion of progress while producing confusion, inefficiency, and demoralization. I love that quote because if you change the name to something more modern, you'd swear that Petronius Arbiter lived in all of our organizations and was commenting on it, things that we saw week in and week out. It's sort of like you know, all of us believe that Dilbert works in our organization too. And the same thing I think is true going all the way back to Petronius Arbiter. Um, it, it seems like we keep making the same mistakes over and over everywhere. And I think there are reasons for that. Large, largely because we don't know how to think in terms of systems. I think Dr. Deming's philosophy will help us to think not just in terms of effective teams. Petronius Arbiter's day had teams, but how to create an, an, an organization around them that supports the teams rather than frustrates and undermines the teams. <clears throat> I want to start out by talking about, uh, before I get to the ingredients of a successful team, I want to talk about when you should use a team. Because uh, one of the things that bothers me is I see all sorts of teams used at times when teams are not the appropriate mechanism. So I have, you'll notice on page four, uh, a series of questions and a scale that you can use for deciding if the team is the appropriate mechanism. So let me just quickly go through these components. One is, uh, is the issue simple or is it complex? If it's complex, you have to break Thing, you have to have representation of the different components of a complex problem. The second one is, does the issue require special expertise or not? If, it's a, if it requires multiple expertise, that expertise is going to have to be reflected on the team. The third is, can the issue be dealt with quickly or is it going to take a long time? Just the sheer duration of, of a project will determine perhaps that you need to have enough people on there to maintain continuity when there's turnover. Um, or transitions on the team. Next, is the issue a single function oriented or is it, is it kind of cut across many functions in the organization? Generally, if you have a cross-functional problem or project, you need a cross-functional team. Finally, is the issue controversial or not? If it's very controversial, by and large, it's better to have some dissenters represented on the team itself and get rid of the dissent and the controversy um, early on rather than wait until after the team has made its recommendations. Will implementation be easy or will impl implementation be complex? If implementation is going to be extremely complex, then um, uh, have, have the people who are going to have to bear the burden of the implementation represented on the team. The next set of notes is going to be uh, with regard to the ingredients of a successful team. And I think what we'll do is take our break first and talk about the ingredients after that. Jack? Thank you, Peter. Uh, brilliant insights that you know, we've heard so far. But as Peter just pointed out, uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, we'll come back uh, in just a little while uh, after you've had your break. and We've had our break. And we'll continue to talk about teams, why we work together. In the meantime, don't forget you've got uh, 
two numbers that you can use now if you want to call in your uh, comments or questions, 1-800-442-4613. And if you choose not to come on the air, you prefer to send your question in uh, without coming on, uh, the phone number is 1-800-760-6067 for faxes. So both 800 for voice, 442-4613. We promise to bring you on the air. If you choose the fax, 760-6067. Uh, we're going to take our break now. We'll see you in about, uh, ten, in about 10 minutes. Take care, and uh, we'll be talking to you. Welcome back from our break. I uh, hope you uh, made good use of it. It's time now to continue with our presentation. Today's guest, of course, being uh, Peter Schultes, talking about teams, why we work together. Uh, Peter's going to pick up now where he left off uh, just before the break and continue on talking about the uh, fourth module of his presentation. Uh, when he finishes his uh, formal presentation, we'll begin to uh, the question and answer session. We already have a couple of questions came in from the uh, Government Accounting Office Training Institute. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to any calls or faxes uh, that you may uh, like to share with us uh, on behalf of this particular topic. And with that, I'll turn it back to Peter and uh, Module 4. Peter? Thanks, Jay. I just want to spend a couple more minutes talking about the ingredients of successful teams. <clears throat> um, and, and the source of this is a variety of uh, uh, research, re uh, research reports on successful teams, uh, for instance, a study done by Westinghouse uh, Center for Quality and Productivity. Also, some clients of mine, consulting clients, uh, had, gotten, had gotten far enough along that they started to do their own research using their own teams, finding out what are the characteristics of the successful teams as opposed to those teams that were not successful. So uh, these two and a whole host of other studies now, there's been ample research on the subject of what makes some teams successful and some unsuccessful. So let's start with, uh, and I've organized all these various things around 
uh, the three categories in the diagram that you had seen earlier of uh, purpose systems teamwork. Uh, so with regard to purpose, there are several ingredients uh, that are characteristic of successful teams. The purpose, the team's purpose must be clear, and we've commented on that already. Elevating and altruistic. This surprised me when I first heard it, but, but by and large, teams are more successful if they're pursuing some purpose that they're excited about, that they recognize will be beneficial for uh, the customer, for the company, that they're doing something that's worth doing. And a lot of times, particularly in the quality movement, a lot of the projects can be directly related to, to something of benefit to the customer. So I think that's an important ingredient of success. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 another characteristic re with regard to purpose is that the purpose must be achievable. Um, uh, I have seen time and time again teams set up and given a, uh, a goal or a purpose which is uh, tantamount to solve world hunger, um, bring peace to the world, do good and avoid evil, something that's so vague and so general and so huge in scope that it's virtually unattainable. The more defined a, a team's purpose can be, the more likely it will be to be success. It should be focused. Dr. Kano, one of the leading teachers of quality from Japan, has said, um, and he has worked with many American companies, and he has said, Americans must learn to go an inch wide and a mile deep. Too often you go an inch deep and a mile wide. We must learn to do few things well rather than many things inadequately. And then also the purpose must be constant. I know of a team in a, in a, a very successful team in an insurance company, and they were just about to bring a, a major success in the, in the project they were working on when management decided to change priorities, took them off that project, put them on another project, and they, were, they had a terrible uh, morale problem with that group of people just because of uh, the inconstancy of management. <clears throat> There are a group of ingredients related to the systems and processes and methods. And mostly what I want to say is, here is that there's a whole technology of improvement that's been developed for the last uh, 45 years. Very specific, very hard-nosed. The, the old way to solve problems used to be, let's get our best minds in the same room together. They will define what the problem is. And by virtue of the fact that they're the ones that defined it, that will then be declared the problem. And they will define what the solution is. And similarly, uh, because they're the experts and they said that's the solution, uh, that's what it is. Well, that's the old-fashioned way of solving problems. And it doesn't work. For the most part, it doesn't work. And there's a very precise methodology, uh, the seven basic tools and a number of other tools. Many of the tools are statistically based. And we not only need, need to know how to use them, but when to use them, uh, when this tool is appropriate or that tool is appropriate. Um, there's various resources available for learning those. And, and I urge you to learn how to do that. That's part of being um, uh, a, a new form of literacy for managers and organizations, is to understand the methodology of improvement. It includes not only the use of tools and data, but it's also a certain logic. There's such logic, uh, I, I refer to logic as the general strategies for improvement, such as the PDCA or PDSA cycle that I referred to before. There's a seven-step method, which the Japanese call the QC story. Uh, there are various resources for that. There's, the, there's, there are sort of, uh, chapter five of the team handbook has a number of such strategies described in them. But I would urge you to learn what has been the tried and proven uh, sequence of steps in trying to solve problems. Uh, there's a lot has been learned about how to do that well. And you use data and logic uh, um, in planning and problem solving, decision making, all those things listed on the bottom of 4-7. The third area of ingredients has to do with teamwork itself. And part of the teamwork that's necessary for a small group of people consists of the support that they get from outside themselves within the organization. So a team should be characterized by active support from the managers of the organization. The, uh, they ought to have, the team members ought to have the freedom to work on this effort without the intrusion of, of other non-emergencies. One of the common problems that I see with teams is that they are assigned to a project, they're assigned to a team to work on a project, but they aren't given time to work on it. They're expected to carry on their other duties as well as this. That's a kiss of death. That sends a terrible message to people. In effect, it says, 
your, this, the work on this project is, is, is not of sufficient priority that, that we are going to relieve you of some of the other duties or postpone some of the other duties or ask other people to take those things over. We're going to pretend like you weren't doing a full-time job before and, and that this won't be another major responsibility. <clears throat> Uh, there ought to be clear roles and expectations. The team handbook spends some time on what those roles are and, and how to establish those expectations. Uh, there ought to be access to people skilled in the improvement methodologies. So we think each team ought to have uh, at least the ability to contact someone who knows a lot about how to apply the different tools or methods. When the team, it's, when it's time for a team to do a Pareto chart, they ought to have somebody there who will teach them how to do one or a fishbone chart, or a X bar and R chart, or all the other tools. Um, it's not enough to send people to class and then expect them to remember what they learned in class. They need somebody available to do just-in-time training, teaching teams how to use different methodologies, the right methodologies, when they need to use those methodologies. Uh, there's some various skills, meeting management, discussion facilitation, uh, giving and receiving feedback. Those are all part of the day-to-day -day life of a team, and, pe and people need to learn how to do those things. Um, teams need to learn how to take conflicts and disagreements and rather than turn them into negative, divisive experiences, turn them into experiences whereby they can learn something from the disagreements. Disagreements are, you should be seen as something healthy, something that will allow us to learn something as opposed to something divisive and destructive. But the secret is in how you handle them, how you respond to them, how you work through the issues and resolve them. And then finally, teams should be characterized by caring and trust and pride and joy, and uh, and I know um, I know one organization, a healthcare organization, that actually worked hard at creating uh, those kinds of characteristics in the organization. They e even had uh, anchored definitions of what's what's tr what's mistrust, what's trust, and as a way of sort of allowing people to reflect how they're doing with regard to those extremes for trust for pride, for a caring, and sensitivity to each other. What I want to do now is finally finish up my, my formal remarks by referring you to the uh, successful team checklist. And I offer this for you as a way of summarizing much of what we've talked about. The checklist itself begins on page 4-9. And you can use the checklist in your own teams back home as a You'll notice that this checklist is loaded, that, that the, uh, the, the right-hand side of the checklist incorporates some of those things that I think are important if we're looking at characteristics of teams uh, consistent with the syst systems thinking and, uh, and, and the, the, the things we've learned in the quality movement. <clears throat> so the first characteristic is that the purpose of, of the team, is it clear and specific and focused as opposed to unclear and too large in scope? And I have these things on a six-point scale that where you <clears throat> on your teams can individually circle the number that you think is characteristic of your team. And then the purpose of this is not to come up with a grade or a number. The purpose of it is to provoke a discussion. So you use the number that you circle to, as a basis of discussion. Where, were the, where are the differences? What, why did somebody on the team give it a 2 and somebody else gave it, gave it a 5, for instance? It's the discussion that's important, not the number that you circle. The second item on the checklist has to do with the uh, relationship with the outside customers. Will the outside customers care about this project? Or is it established in response to their needs? Uh, that's, I think, a, a critical factor. Too often I seen, see, when I, go to, when I go to companies, one of the things that I notice is that there's too many projects, usually, too many teams, and too many of what they're doing, the projects that they're doing, have no relationship whatsoever to the outside customer. The third item on the checklist has to do with the, uh, the, the, something I mentioned already. Is the purpose of the project elevating, or is it a matter of little consequence? If, if, if it's not a very important project, it probably won't get much attention, probably doesn't deserve much attention. Managers will lose interest. Project team members will lose interest. Um, so don't do it. How about the planning that's behind this project? Is the, is the is the pr planning for the project and the effort of the team carefully planned using the, the things that we know about improvement methodology, or is there no planning? Is it just uh, by the seat of the pants planning? How about access to expertise? 
there are two kinds of expertise that I have been making re reference to. At least I've been making reference to the improvement methodology expertise, people who know how to do the various tools and logic of improvement. But there's another kind of expertise. Each of us works in a business which has its own professional or technical expertise. So to what extent is the, is the, uh, the reservoir of knowledge and expertise that's in your company uh, used in this project? Uh, sometimes people believe that in the interests of democracy and teamwork, we shouldn't listen to the experts in our company. If your company makes paper, there's a, there's a science of paper making, and the people who are knowledgeable about that science ought to be involved in those parts of the project that have direct connection with the science of, of making paper. Um, that's what I mean by the item number five. Item number six is the other kind of expertise I've already mentioned, improvement methodology. Is there no awareness of it in this group, or is there just-in-time coaching from someone skilled in the improvement methodology? Item seven has to do with the nature of meetings. I've been shocked sometimes going into organizations, sometimes Fortune 100 household name companies, and the top managers of those organizations run meetings like like they have no clue about what, an organ, what a meeting is. The meetings seem to start in the middle and stop in the middle. No agenda, no, no discipline, no focus. Um, so are your meetings characterized by being disorganized and unfocused and rambling, or, or do you have a very specific planned agenda? Are, you, are your meetings facilitated as well as being well planned in one of the previous items in the checklist? Item eight has to do with your project work. Is it, is it well documented? Is it frequently and variously communicated? One of the characteristics of successful teams is the amount of communication between the team and the work they're doing and those in the organization around them. Successful teams are characterized by multiple uh, modes of communication constantly uh, being used to communicate what they're doing to a lot of people throughout the rest of the organization. Finally, the spirit of your team is your is your this is the spirit of your team that of a close knit unit with exciting work, pride and joy, or um, or is there no cohesiveness? Are you just simply an aggregate of individuals? Uh, on questions such as this, what you can do is if you agree that your your collective response is somewhere over on the left side of the continuum, you can ask the question: What do we need to do to move ourselves toward the right? So to sum up all of these comments and all of the ones I said before the break, uh, good teams don't happen by accident any more than good gardens happen by accident or good businesses happen by accident or good families happen by accident. They require careful work, careful attention, um, uh, a lot of thoughtfulness. The wisdom of the Cherokees probably tells us all of what we need to know um, and, and, and maybe I just could have started, started and stopped with, with the wisdom of the Cherokees, but it wouldn't have made a very long or interesting show. But in any event, keep in mind what the Cherokees tell us, uh, the ingredients for success. Clear intention, skillful means, and affirmation, a consistent set of values that we act on as we're doing our work in teams. Thanks. Outstanding. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some questions that were sent to us by fax during the break by uh, some folks at the uh, GAO, the Government Accounting Office Training Institute. Uh, I'm going to share those questions with Peter and look to uh, his responses. In the meantime, uh, I would urge you, since we have not received any further uh, faxes or phone calls, to, uh, if this is an opportunity to take a very expensive and a very perceptive individual and use his, his, his brain power, his experience, uh, his wisdom to your advantage. Please give us a call at 800-442-4613 or fax us at 800-760-6067. I see that we've got uh, some additional faxes that have come in. I'll take a look at these, Peter, uh, while uh, you're answering the first question that we have from the uh, Government Accounting Office. Uh, our, our author of these questions, who has not identified him or herself, says, are you using the words goal and purpose interchangeably? Pretty much so, although I recognize it's, uh, in some contexts you, you should differentiate between what you mean by a goal and a purpose. But um, um, 
I, su I suppose most of the time I have been using them interchangeably, and, and if I were to be more precise, I would have used the word purpose rather than goal. Goal is what, you, uh, what you're aiming at achieving now in order to pursue some larger purpose. What I say is important is the clarity of the larger purpose. For me, the word purpose and goal are similar to the word systems and processes. They define a scale of effort more than, more than anything distinctly different. OK. Uh, you might be interested to know, Peter, that these uh, additional three pages of questions, guess where they're from? The GAO Training Institute. <laughs> Good for them. Thank you, <laughs> GAO. <laughs> uh, our second question that we received earlier from the GAO Training Institute, uh, our, uh, the author of our questions asked this question on page 2-5, which I'm turning to here in the uh, participant notes. Mm -hmm. And on page 2-5, uh, he says to you, Peter, that you say purpose is comprised of how and when. I thought purpose was why. At, at, at a, again, at a technical level, you're right. But sometimes uh, you don't have a clear definition of the purpose without some other information that you won't get by asking simply the question why. For, for instance, if you're dealing with some, let's say you're working on a project to improve uh, delivery time. How long does it take to, for you to get your widgets from your uh, op manufacturing operation to the customer's uh, receiving dock or something like that? Now, now we, so we can start out by agreeing that you'll never be able to do it instantaneously, and at least until we develop Star Trek uh, beam me up Scotty type uh, technology, there's going to be a certain amount of time from, um, from sending it out to it being received. The, you want to reduce that time. Now, now the, the purpose is you know, why. Why is it important to reduce the amount of time? You define that from the customer's point of view. But also the purpose for this particular project might be defined by you know, when will you have achieved the amount of improvement that's important to the customer. That is, how, how long is too long? How, how short is just right? How can you define, operationally define, the purpose in terms, especially when the project itself is dealing with a time uh, factor, how can, can you define the purpose specifically enough that you can say, here is when our work, at least for now, will be completed. We have achieved, uh, when we have achieved a certain amount of improvement that will be recognized by the customer as a dramatic breakthrough from what we have given them in the past. So it's, it's defining when the project is over, at least for now when the improvement is done. And I'm, I, you know, don't call me back and say, I thought PDCA was an endless cycle. I agree, you're never finished. But sometimes you say, we only have a certain amount of resources to dedicate to improvement. So when this improvement gets to this stage, we will turn our resources to something else and, and, and eventually come back to this thing that we just worked on and improve it some more. Uh, following up on that, I'll, I'll get back to the GAO questions in a second. When you're going from PDCA to PDSA and back again over a period of time. You know, this may, we may be talking years. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, I've seen that pictured on a kind of a stair step kind of thing where you've got PDCA when you're trying to improve things, PDSA when you're trying to standardize and get every, encourage everyone to be doing it the same way. And that ultimately this combination of going up the stair steps, PDCA, PDSA, PDCA, et cetera, is really the basis of Kaizen. Uh I have not seen it pictured that way. That, let me tell you my understanding of the PDCA, PDSA controversy. Dr. Deming taught the Japanese what he referred to as the Schuhart cycle back in 1950. And, um, and the Japanese adapted that. Uh, it, it, uh, it amazed me when I made a fir my first trip to Japan to notice how, how saturated the country was with this notion of PDCA. They call it PDCA. It's an acronym that stands for Plan, Do, Check, Act. Dr. Deming has said all along he doesn't like the word check. He prefers that it not be called Plan, Do, Check, Act, but Plan, Do, Study, Act. And his reason for that was the word check for him indicated to constrain. It's the way you, you, you hold things in check. 
as opposed to study, which means you kind of open up and examine them and learn from them. Uh, it's a semantic difference. I once asked Dr. Deming, Dr. Deming, when you go to your doctor, do you have him study your blood pressure instead of check your blood pressure? And his response was, Hum. So I decided it wasn't a conversation worth pursuing. But the point is, um, it's so widespread in Japan, the Plan Do Check Act version of it is so widespread in Japan. It's, you know, why should we confuse things by creating a second standard, even though the guy who invented it would prefer to call it something else? So if, if you run into somebody who talks about PDSA, they're probably a, 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 a devoted Deming disciple who would not um, refer to it differently than he does. Um, usually when I'm around the devoted Deming disciples, I call it PDSA just to avoid the controversy. The devoted Deming disciples. <laughs> DDD. DDD. D cubed. Okay, I, I see in looking at the handwriting on these various faxes that we received from the GAO Training Institute, they all appear to be from different people. So that's, that's a very good sign. Our next question for you, uh, quote, what methods tools, et cetera, would you recommend for developing a clear, unambiguous purpose and ensuring that purpose is stated or communicated in this way? The author further says, I'm a member of a self-directed work team, and we are having difficulty identifying our purpose. And he even says, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I'm not surprised you're having, having difficulty identifying your purpose. The purpose should have been defined by those people who, okay. who set it up in the first place. What, why in the world do managers set up something like a self-directed work team without first thinking, why are we doing this? Um, the, the way that I like, the tool that I like to use in defining purpose is uh, and, and, uh, there's a, a logic that precedes the actual setting up of a team. And it's a logic by which you identify from all the possible good things to do, you identify a priority. And don't pick a whole bunch of priorities, just pick one or two. Go an inch wide and a mile deep on a single priority. And then you start asking the question, what will it take to successfully accomplish this single priority? And you keep asking that question until you have a set of activities that you undertake some of them run by teams, some of them not run by teams. Now, it's called a tree diagram is the tool that you use to go through this analysis so that, so that you don't even set up a team until you know what it is you have to do to accomplish some major priority. Unfortunately, too often, we set up the, the teams and then decide what to do with them. That's a little bit, you know, it violates the old architectural norm of form follows function. Uh, form the form, meaning the team or self-directed team, should not be determined until you know what the function is, what the purpose is, what you're trying to accomplish. And and uh, so, if you've got a self-directed team and you don't have a purpose, how do you go about doing that? Uh, I would go back to the people who set it up, and and conduct a fairly profound, uh, prolonged dialogue with them to say what. Tell us exactly what you had in mind. Peter, good news. We have a phone call. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether the caller is male or, or female. Uh, the, the name is Madrick, excuse me, Nadrick, and uh, this individual is from Magnavox. And uh, they have a question for us. Uh, Mr. or Ms. Nadrick, would you come online, please? Uh, yes, sir. Um, it's Mr., uh, obviously. The uh, question that I have as an engineer and working in an engineering group, uh, it seems to me like so a lot of our tasks are overflowing each other and we doesn't seem to have a clear purpose from the upper uh, organization at times and I was wondering is there a way that we could convey that to our upper management or Peter? something to that effect. Yeah, and you're, you're, you know, you're describing almost uh, using a, the lowercase letter P a political issue. Um, yeah, what I have, there's no simple answer to your question because a lot of what you're able to do uh, will reflect some of the conditions in your organization, how receptive management is to uh, uh, impudent questions. Uh, if they would call them impudent, then you know you're in trouble to start with. But, but can you sit down with managers and say, 
um, let's talk about what benefits you're hoping to achieve by this, if it's a self-directed work team or whatever. What are the things that you were unhappy with before that you're hoping we will be able to more successfully deal with? Um, there are uh, varieties of questions that all pivot around the theme of you must have had something in mind, tell us what that is, or let us ask questions that will help you deepen your own thinking about this. Um, how, you know, for instance, a, a, variety, a couple other varieties of questions. Uh, uh, how will, at some point, you're going to want to judge whether we're successful or not, or whether you made the right decision in setting up these teams. What are the kind of things you're going to use as indicators of success? That would be an example of a question. But the secret is to have leaders of the organization, managers in the organization that are willing to think that way, to think in terms of, of pursuing um, purposes and goals and measures of success. Uh, Mr. Nedrick, does that uh, respond sufficiently to your question? Uh, yes, yes, sir. And uh, out of curiosity, uh, which division of Magnavox are you with? Uh, what city are you in? Fort Wayne, Indiana. Ah, very good. Okay. Uh, I appreciate your call and uh, look forward to hearing from you again sometime. Thank you. Take good care. Bye. Uh, we've got some more questions that have come in by fax uh, for Peter. Uh, another one from the GAO Training Institute, but in addition, we've also got some. Uh, that have come in uh, recently from Milliken and Company. Uh, and another one that I saw here a moment ago that I've managed to lose, but I'll, uh, oh, here it is, from Hawkeye Community College in Waterloo, Iowa. But we'll get to those in order. And so our next question, still from GAO Training Institute for Peter, can you create an environment of teamwork without the creation of teams? I, I think they're very different. Um, Though, though probably the short answer to your question is no. I think, I think creating teams is probably a necessary step. But, but the point that I was trying to make is that if you can set up small groups, but if within the company there's a lot of divisiveness, if there's a lot of barriers between units in the, in the organization, if there's a lot of in, internal competition and adversarial relationships. If there's a lot of the, the, the larger issues that divide people, it's going to make it very difficult for the small groups to succeed. And I don't, and, and while maybe sometimes the smaller groups can help be an instrument of removing the barriers and the divisiveness in the larger sense of the organization, um, it may be that you have to work on them both at the same time. Um, I have seen, for instance, uh, my favorite example is, is Falk Gear in Milwaukee, a subsidiary of the Sunstrand organization. Uh, they changed their policies, and this is a long story, and I'm not going to tell the long story, but I'll, the short version is this. They took a year to examine their policies and to see how would they change their personnel policies if they based those policies on trust instead of distrust. When they looked at their policies, they realized the policies were aimed, were presumed that people were going to screw off. So they changed the policies to reflect an attitude of trust. For instance, you could take bereavement leave uh, without having to prove to the personnel department that this person really died and that you were really related to them. Or that they even existed. Or that they even existed. They just said, we know that when somebody close to you dies, you want to take some time off, work it out with your supervisor, end of policy. And, um, and it was accompanied by a massive educational effort, not only just on the new policies, but on the whole new philosophy. And they had a major reduction in the use of sick leave, partly because they, what they did was to create a, an organization where, where people were treated as adults, not like children, where people were treated as responsible adults, not like untrustworthy children. And so, so that changed apart from any work that they did in teams and small groups, it changed the environment. It changed the, the culture of the organization by working on policies. OK. Uh, the last question we have from GAO Training Institute, very similar uh, to this, the one you just addressed, but they've added a kicker to it. Uh, the initial part of the question is, can you have teamwork without teams? And I think you've pretty well addressed that subject. But they, they supplement that by asking that you address the difference between teamwork that is working 
toward a, t a common goal and a team? I think teams are a, a means to the end. Um, so that if you, if you take the whole organization, what is its purpose? Um, who are its customers? What are the needs of the customers? How do we define our priorities? Um, and, and how do we organize ourselves uh, around those common goals, those common purposes? And that does not necessarily mean we organize our, around our, ourselves around small teams, because sometimes the work that needs to be done doesn't need to be done by a team. But if that individual is working on something, it's, a, it's working on something that's con consonant with the larger goals of the organization. And those goals are, uh, and purposes, I'll use both words, the goals and purposes are, are sufficiently clear, clear and communicated and, and people are constantly aware of them that every individual and every group in the organization uh, works together to achieve those. But, but um, I don't know if, uh, if there's more to the question than that. I, I, it would seem to me, Peter, that uh, earlier, uh, when you were finishing off your comments in, in Module 4, uh, that you were talking about the team checklist, it would seem to me that this would be a really good place to use the checklist, when to use a, a team yeah. checklist. Yes, OK, yeah. That, that might be it. That, and, and even if the checklist would indicate that you don't need a team for this particular work, you still need teamwork. If I'm an individual working on a project, I need to make sure that what I'm doing is understood by and in, involves in various ways a variety of people who may not be part of a team, but who are very important to the work of, the, of this project that I may be conducting individually. It's literally a team of one with, with ad hoc contributors on an ad need as, ad, as needed basis. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully that, that resolves that particular issue. Uh, our next question from Hawkeye Community College in Waterloo, Iowa. Now, here's, here we are going off onto an entirely new topic. Are you ready for this, Peter? I, I, yes. Did, did you see the movie Quiz Show? <laughs> no, I didn't. It's all, all about the scandals of you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, quiz shows and television in the, in the 50s. And, and I promise yeah. you, Jack has not fed me the answers <laughs> in advance. Because I didn't have the questions in advance. Uh, how do you define a pay system based on Dr. Deming's systems view of an organization. <laughs> Let me reread that. Yeah. How do you define a pay system based on Dr. Deming's system view of an organization? That's, a, I think, a pretty neat question. It's a neat question. It's a whole other topic, and I'll take a crack at it. One of the, one of the important factors in determining a pay system is to not create a pay system that's divisive. And, and so you, you, you don't want a pay system that's capricious so that people end up getting paid more because they're lucky. If you understand a system and variation in the system, you're not, you will be doing a whole lot less pretending that you, know, that you can discern when individuals deserve some kind of merit bonus, for instance. So, so, um, the, the whole topic of performance appraisal is, is a, I mean, I do a two and a half day seminar on it, so I'm, I'm not hardly going to answer the, the, the question very thoroughly in the short time that I have. But, but so you want to remove any of the elements of caprice, any of the elements of luck from the pay system. And as far as I can tell, there's only three non-capricious bases for paying someone. So that's, so it's consistent with systems thinking not so much directly that systems thinking tells you this is the way to pay people, but systems thinking will tell you that to don't do anything that rewards people for being lucky, don't do anything that rewards people in a way that disregards the existence of a system and the existence of variation in the system. The three non-capricious ways to pay people are market. What does the market pay someone who does this kind of work? Uh, seniority some increment uh, reflecting how many years they've worked for the company. The usual argument against that, by the way, is but then you reward people who are dead wood. To which I respond, why are you hiring dead wood? Or why are you hiring live wood and killing it? So, so market, seniority, and profit sharing. And if you're in a nonprofit organization, you don't have the third one. I make a distinction between profit sharing and prosperity sharing. Prosperity sharing I'm sorry, profit sharing and um, um, 
I'm blocking the name for it, but it's a, the, the, the thing I'm, I'll remember the name before I finish the comment. When you, when at the beginning of the fiscal year, you identify a pot of money and then a set of goals. And if at the end of the year you've achieved the goals, you release the pot of money and pay, and pay it to people. Some of you are probably whispering to each other what the word is that I seem to have a mental block on. But in any, in any event, um, it, it, the say, it's the same as management by objectives and the cynical managerial premise behind this yet unknown to, in my mind, uh, uh, concept is, is that people are withholding a certain amount of effort waiting for it to be bribed out of them. Um, if, the, if the goal is within the capability of the system, you shouldn't need to have a bribe to make people do it. You just have to focus efforts and, and attention on it. Um, and if it's not within the capability of the system, all the money in the world won't make it possible. Uh, that's, uh, I feel like I've given an inadequate answer to a very complex question. Very, very so. Uh, we have another question for us. Uh, this one with regard to the subject of empowerment, and it's from Bob Holmes at uh, Millican and Company, one of the early winners of the Baldridge uh, Prize, the Malcolm Baldridge National mm -hmm. Quality Award. Uh, Mr. Holmes says, please clarify why empowerment is not significant in the Deming system view. Um, I never heard Deming argue against the uh, em empowerment, though I think he would. Um, in, in your notes, in the earlier pages of your notes um, on uh, page 1-5, for the sake of the graphics people, it's slide 5, 5A and 5B, um, you'll notice two diagrams. And let's take a look at the old way to view an organization. Um, now, that's the prevailing mentality. These are not just two graphics. These are two states of mind. And in the hierarchical state of mind, you, 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 you look at the people who, at the higher part, of the upper part of the organization, the, the people who have power, the people traditionally at the bottom of the organization don't have power. So the notion is there's some things that the people at the, uh, the bottom of the organization traditionally have not been allowed to do that they ought to do because it makes sense. So we... So when a customer comes into a retail store with a complaint about a product and wants to exchange it, um, the clerk behind the counter ought to be able to do what's important for the customer and not have to check with his or her supervisor. That's the idea. You empower the, the clerk at the counter to make those decisions rather than have the supervisor do it. Well, that, that's a good thing to do. I don't have any quarrel with that. There's all sorts of decisions that ought to be made at a lower level in the organization. Most decisions are made two or three levels higher than they should be. So I'm not against redistributing the, the decisions, the locus of decisions in an organization. My quarrel is why do we have to phrase it in terms such as power? That's a political term. Why is this a political struggle in which people at the higher levels of the organizations grace, gracefully, grace, graciously give up power? There's, a, there's a, a, an implicit paternalism, paternalism excuse me, in the word empowerment. Those who empower can also disempower. And the fact that it's put in the terms of power implies the continuation of the hierarchical frame of mind. Now, if you look at the systems view of the organization, where does, what does power have to do with that? In the systems view of the organization, you do those things that make sense for the customer. It makes sense to let the clerk make adjustments to uh, uh, faulty merchandise, the clerk in a retail store. Without because, having to check with somebody. Because it makes sense to, to do it for the customer. That's the driving force behind it. It's not this kind of paternalistic sharing of power. Why? Why? So it's the it's the... The, the, what we call, it's not what we do under the word empowerment, it's usually pretty good stuff to do, but, it's, but why do we call it that? Why don't we call it doing better stuff for the customer? Why do we phrase it and frame it within a hierarchical uh, paternalistic uh, frame of mind? So I, I might be being real picky about this, but I think sometimes what we call things is important. I agree. We have a, another question from the GAO Training Institute and I have been severely chided because, as it turns out, GAO is not the Government Accounting Office. It's the General Accounting Office of the federal government. 
And so for that, ladies Shame and gentlemen, I, I apologize. I accept the wrist slap, and I will never make that mistake again, you, but you can be sure I'll make many others. Uh, on page 1-3 of uh, uh, Peter's handouts, we have a question now, once again, from the GAO, Training Institute. The question is, where does culture fit into this model? Interesting that the, this question, just as an aside, because last night, uh, as Peter and I were uh, having dinner, we got into a, a very long discussion about the subject of organizational culture organi and, orga and uh, managerial climate. Question is, where does culture fit into this model? I sit on many teams. It sounds like a busy person. I sit on many teams, and it seems like our greatest problem is breaking cultural norms that keep us constrained to the old systems and processes. How do we go about changing systems and processes until we change our culture? I knew somebody was going to ask a question about culture because um, because I used the word culture myself in the presentation toward the latter parts of the uh, of the presentation when I was talking about Falk gear and how their change in the policies uh, changed the culture. Um, in spite of the fact that I just used it and at the risk of being hypocritical, I would, I would suggest that we call a moratorium on the word culture uh, as it applies to organizations. Uh, organiza uh, the word culture is an anthropological word, not an organizational term. And, and here's my, my difficulty with the word culture is that too often it's used to describe things as though they were ineffable. The culture of an organization is, if I were to use that word at all, it's, it's the day-to-day -day work experience of the, of the average worker in an organization. If I went to be a lathe operator in this organization or in that organization, I would notice some differences. And I might have trouble identifying the differences because they have to do with relationships and, and, and various things. But, but the net effect of those would be the culture of the organization. Um, and, and they are difficult to identify. They're sort of the common cause, day-to-day -day experience in the organization. They're difficult to identify. They're difficult to change. Too often, what we describe as culture are things that are eminently changeable. In Falk gear, they could change the policies. And it did change the experience of people in the organization. Um, it changed the behaviors of people in the organization. But if we, instead of using the word culture, if we use behaviors, we would probably make uh, these things that we're noticing and experiencing, probably make them a little less unapproachable. And, and um, there was an article about, oh, five years ago, six years ago, written by an anthropologist who had just come back from anthropological studies in the Fiji Islands or something, who worked for a computer organization and was observing the, the top managers of this computer organization having these endless discussions on how they were going to change their organizational culture. And he had some wonderful insights as to why that was such a foolish thing to do. Um, find out what, what needs improving and improve it and not worry about culture. Um, so, uh, and, and I bet if, if we were to study the teams that you're describing, what you describe as culture are very improvable Phenomenon: different behaviors, different policies, different procedures. Peter, we're getting uh, quite close to the end. We've got a couple of more faxes here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll uh, just let me uh, read uh, this next one. Also, guess where it's from? GAO. The GAO, uh, Training Institute. Question is, what are ways to build linkages across teams? I think that's an excellent question. It's a great question. And, and, and again, one of the things that I noticed besides there being too many teams and too many teams that don't have any relevance at all to the outside customer, I'll notice that while individual teams may be do, doing things that are worthwhile, the, the collectively they go nowhere. So again, the answer to this question is one that I said before with regard to purpose. Um, it's in the planning stages that you have those linkages. If you have identified one single uh, purpose, one single goal or one single priority, let me use that word, that's important for the organization. And then you keep asking the question, what will it take to successfully accomplish this? And you'll end up with, I know, and I know in the Southern Pacific Railroad, they had one, one specific uh, goal that they were trying to achieve, an improvement goal, that ended up with about 70 different projects dealing with di different aspects of that goal. Now, what linked these teams together was this common larger purpose. And in fact, they could report to each other and learn from each other and sometimes combine what they were doing because the nature of the work 
made that important. So, uh, so it's difficult to link uh, projects together when they don't share some kind of common purpose. And I would urge organizations to do the planning necessary to identify a few priorities and have all of the projects and all of the teams work on those priorities. We have time for about one last question. I've got one personally that I, I would like to ask Peter. Uh, early on in the presentation in the first module, you sp we were talking about viewing an organization, the old style, the hierarchical, hi hierarchical. It's easy for you to yeah, say. Yeah, right. Uh, a style of organizations versus the Deming systems approach. What I would appreciate from you in, in about one minute, because we're getting very close to the end, is any recommendations that you would make both to me and to our viewing audience relative to how do you transition an organization from the old style to the Deming approach of uh, organization? Um, the best way that I know is to do it um, product by product or service by service. Take a service that your organization provides and you'll know who the people in your organization are that directly provide that service to the customers and then what are all the steps preceding that which add value on its way and then get the people that are part of that flow of work together in some kind of forum to talk about that, how they can improve it, what, how, how they are interdependent on each other. On each other. And the types of teams materials that are there on, in section three of the notes identify a business team and the business team is essentially that. It's taking a product and tracking it through the organization as it flows through there, because there is a system there. It's just organizing people around the system as opposed to organizing around the hierarchy. Got it. Ladies and gentlemen, you've, you've heard the words of the master, uh, Peter Schultes, uh, talking to us about teams, why we work together. Next month, uh, we'll have the, the benefit of Bill Conway, as I mentioned earlier, the former CEO of Nashua Corporation, now chairman of his own organization, the Conway Quality Consulting Organization. Uh, Bill will be with us uh, from Northeastern University. I'd like to take this opportunity to say, Peter, a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Outstanding Thanks, job. Nothing, nothing less than I expected. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your questions, the calls, the, uh, the faxes. We'll look forward to talking to you next month when we'll be with Bill Conway. Until that time, take care and think quality.